Today, we will learn how to generate aspirations correctly. Yesterday, we discussed the problems that tend to arise after generating aspirations. We should avoid regressing to samsaric minds. Currently, some people haven't reached the stage of avoiding regressing to samsaric minds yet. They are always controlled by samsaric minds without any buddhicitta at all. Such people should have a sense of shame. Don't be shameless. At least, you should be ashamed and aware that others are doing better than you. How to generate aspirations correctly? The Tripitaka, consisting of 12 branches of the Buddha's teachings, all expound the nature of our mind and helps us understand it. If we don't understand our mind and the various misconceptions about it, we won't be able to generate aspirations correctly. Although Buddhists care about the world, our ultimate goal in caring about the world is to solve the problems of the mind. This is because many of our afflictions arise from a wrong understanding of the world. Duality is a profound topic and we will not delve into it. Ordinary beings cannot connect and unify their minds with the world. Their minds are separate from the world. The two greatest enemies in our spiritual practice are the subject and object of attachment. The Yogacara school clearly explains them to us. The constructed nature turns our infinite life into a finite one. Once we transcend the constructed nature, we will realize the nature of emptiness through the phenomena of dependent arising in the here and now. It is our attachments that turn the world of truth into the world of ordinary beings. Because of our constructed nature, we turn the one true Dharma realm into ten Dharma realms. The Dharma realm is the state of our mind. There are the Buddha realm, the Buddhasattva realm, the human realm, the heavenly realm, the Shravaka and Pratyaka Buddha realm, and the three lower realms. The state of your mind determines the realm you are in. As humans, we are in the realm of ordinary people. Ordinary people are full of greed, anger and ignorance, which confines us to the realm of ordinary beings. After learning the Buddha's teachings, we can gradually elevate and change ourselves. We can eliminate samsaric minds and shatter the shell of ignorance. Throughout history, various religions have emerged. In the Buddha's time, there were 96 non-Buddhist schools. Why can't other religions realize emptiness? Because they haven't correctly understood the truth. They mistakenly regard something that is not the ultimate truth and not emptiness as the true nature of all phenomena. In other words, they haven't thoroughly realized the truth. They regard illusions as the truth. From the ultimate dimension, they are caught in the attachments to self and phenomena to different extents, clinging to some self or phenomenon. What they perceive is not the true nature of things, but rather the appearance which they perceive as real. A correct understanding of the mind is crucial for spiritual practice. Appearances also arise from our minds. It is our minds that perceive them as real. Everything is inseparable from the mind. Only when our understanding reaches this level can we clearly know the first step of generating aspirations. Primarily, there are two correct aspirations, renunciation and bodhicitta. A few days ago, we talked about how to transform the samsaric mind into bodhicitta. There was a stage in between, which is renunciation. 
renunciation can help us transition from the samsaric mind to buddhacitta. To make this transition, we need renunciation. Without renunciation, we cannot transform our samsaric mind into buddhacitta. The renunciation in this context doesn't mean renouncing worldly life. Renunciation it doesn't necessarily mean renouncing worldly life. There are many types of renunciation. Some people want to leave home and can't wait any longer. This is also a kind of renunciation. It is a wish to leave their home. Some couples want to get divorced today without any delay. This kind of renunciation is not what we mean by renunciation. This kind of renunciation is a wish to leave their current circumstances rather than seeking liberation from the three realms. The renunciation we refer to doesn't mean changing from one samsaric mind to another. Instead, it means renouncing all samsaric minds in the three realms and transcending the three realms. Only then can we attain liberation. Without such renunciation, you cannot calm the mind, meditate on non-self and practice the path to liberation. Some people study Buddhism as a philosophy without renunciation. In their past lives, they were philosophers with a habit of studying knowledge. As a result, in this lifetime, they don't have renunciation. However, upon encountering Buddhism, they become interested and start studying it. They think the philosophy of Buddhism is great. It delves deeper and is more profound than the thoughts of other philosophers. It is a philosophy. These people are not practitioners because they lack renunciation. Even if they thoroughly study Buddhist scriptures, they haven't started actual practice. You can look at those worldly philosophers. Back in college, I noticed this phenomenon. They thoroughly study philosophy, but once they return home, they are terrible. They argue with their wife and fight with their children. They get angry and indulge in smoking, drinking and playing at mahjong. They are full of samsaric thoughts and don't have any renunciation at all. They have many hobbies, such as watching football games, playing chess, watching birds, collecting antiques and climbing mountains. When they have nothing to do at home, they may also study Buddhism as a hobby. Such people are not learning at the Buddha's teachings. They merely study Buddhism as a philosophy and don't want to engage in actual practice. They don't seek liberation and never think about transcending the cycle of samsara and they never ponder what to do at the time of death and where to go after death. When we see dead people, especially when we see our loved ones passing away, we immediately become aware of death. However, funeral service workers may feel indifferent when they cremate corpses, as if throwing wood into a stove. Most people wouldn't dare to do this kind of work, as it is hard to push a body that was once alive into the incinerator and watch it burn into ashes. Yet, these workers, after facing numerous corpses every day, gradually lose their fear and vigilance towards death. At this point, the situation becomes tricky. Some people, after becoming monastics, simply switch to a different lifestyle and settle down in a new place. From a psychological perspective, humans have a habitual tendency to become numb. If they get accustomed to a state, they will gradually become indifferent. Sometimes, practitioners also need to relocate. 
Why did monastics in the past often travel? After the rainy season retreat, bhikkhus would go out for a walk. The Buddha taught this in the Vinaya, which has a profound meaning behind it. We cannot always stay in the same place because as time goes by, you may become numb. Similarly, when you study here, sometimes you need to relocate. Of course, if you are really diligent, it indicates that you have already made progress in your practice and achieved a deep concentration. In that case, you should devote yourself to a meditation retreat, which is better for you. Sometimes, beginners do need a change of environment. We cannot be numb like funeral service workers who have become accustomed to seeing many corpses. For example, while each patient considers their illness very serious, doctors treat many patients every day. So, no matter how serious a patient thinks their illness is, a doctor would see it as just one case among thousands. Doctors won't dedicate too much attention to illnesses like patients do. This illustrates how we become numb. As monastics, many of us also fall into this dilemma. After being a monastic for a long time, one tends to regard the monastery as a place to live or another home, only thinking about creating a comfortable atmosphere. Hence, the Buddha advised the monks to constantly be mindful that life exists only between each breath. This way, they can be alert to death and stop clinging to a comfortable life. Therefore, we need to renounce this life and be mindful of the impermanence of life. Otherwise, over time, we will become numb. Even after being a monastic for a long time, one may still fall into this dilemma. Generating renunciation is the foundation of monastic practice. So, what exactly do we need to renounce? We need to renounce the cycle of birth and death, the worldly life, the three realms, and attachments to the five desires and the six sense objects. True renunciation encompasses two aspects, renouncing external bondage and renouncing internal bondage. External bondage refers to the five desires and the six sense objects in the world, and internal bondage refers to attachments to the five desires and the six sense objects as well as the samsaric minds that arise from attachments. Therefore, what we need to renounce is not only the external environment, but also the samsaric mind. In fact, the purpose of renouncing the external environment is to renounce attachments and samsaric minds. Only by freeing ourselves from samsaric minds can we realize the nature of emptiness and eliminate afflictions. Realizing emptiness means that your mind is truly free from the notion of self rather than studying it with the sixth consciousness. Even if you thoroughly study Buddhism with your consciousness, you can only get a product of your sixth consciousness through logical thinking. There are two modes of thinking. One is logical thinking, which involves reasoning. The other is dialectical thinking, which involves unifying opposites. This type of thinking can help us develop wisdom. Dialectical thinking is generally only used by Buddhist practitioners. Most philosophers in the world use logical thinking. However, regardless of their thinking approach, they merely rely on the sixth consciousness without actual practice. This principle is similar to driving. You may have thoroughly studied the manual and the workings of a car, and you may even remember the name of every part and every step in the operation. However, 
you have never actually driven a car. Only through actual driving can you gradually become familiar with the operations, such as shifting gears. Once you start driving, you won't need the manual anymore. If you are about to hit someone and are still thinking about which step in the manual to follow, you would have already hit them. When driving, you don't think about the manual, you just drive. Similarly, in the beginning, one's spiritual practice is only at the intellectual level. Why do I encourage you to go out and practice in various circumstances? Because simply studying every day without actual practice is not enough. Some people are too junior and haven't experienced many challenging circumstances. That's not enough. If one only studies the teachings without experiencing hardships, one will become annoyed when faced with difficulties. Such people need to practice in various circumstances. Simply studying without practice is not enough. Except for those with sharp faculties, for most beginners, simply learning the Buddha's teachings without practice is not enough. You cannot identify your problems. Without experiencing various situations, you won't recognize your numerous problems. It's essential to grow through challenges and trials. 